morning, class. I'd like to wish everyone continued health. Today, we're going to begin the chapter on morality. And let's begin with outlining the uh, work by Immanuel Kant called Groundworks of the Metaphysics of Morals. This is a fascinating book in which Kant makes a rational argument for a objective form of morality. And so I want to provide the outline uh, to this work, and then I want to look at each part of the argument. Uh, for the outline, we'll begin with the bold claim that Kant makes, which is the only unqualified good is a good will. We're going to look at what a good will is and how a good will wills, meaning what it wills. We'll also look at how a good will wills in the sense of uh, being uncertain whether freedom vis-a-vis uh, -vis determinism is, is uh, what exists. And then we're going to look at what the societal implications are for this uh, form of morality. So we'll begin with this first claim that he makes, that the only unqualified good is a good will. And what he means by unqualified is that a good will is good always and everywhere without stipulations or qualifications. Everything else that we think is good, that we consider good, uh, can very well be good, but is good in a qualified way. And we'll look at what that qualification means. So other things that are understood to be good, uh, health would be an example, uh, riches, money, intelligence, uh, virtues such as patience. These are goods, but they're good for Kant in a qualified way, meaning if a person with a good will possesses them, then they are good. But imagine if a person with an evil will possessed these things, then they would be considered evil because the person with an evil will could use them for evil. So if a person with an evil will uh, was very intelligent, then they could use that intelligence to um, create more evil in the world. If a person with an evil will was um, really healthy, then they could live longer and in that longer life inflict more evil. And this just continues. If a person with an evil will was patient, then they could patiently plot more evil things. So these things that are perceived goods, such as intelligence, uh, riches, health, patience, they are, but only in possession, only um, when they are in possession of, of uh, or only when they are possessed by a person with a good will. So what is a good will for Kant? A good will is a will that wills something uh, for the sake of duty. And this is different from a person uh, willing something that happens to be in alignment with duty. We'll talk about what the good will should will in particular or universally in a second, um, which becomes the, uh, the right thing. Um, but a person's actions can be in alignment with what the right thing is to do, but they could not necessarily do it for the right reasons. What are the right reasons? Uh, out of duty's sake. So we'll think of, of two examples that, that Kant gives. So one is a person who owns a store and sells things at a fair price. Um, so selling things at a fair price is good. Now, why does the person sell it at a fair price? This is important for Kant because the intentions matter. If a person sells things at a fair price because they want repeat business, because they think in the long run it'll be good for their store if they sell things at a fair price, because if they didn't sell things at a fair price, then people would shop elsewhere and they would be out of business. This selling things at a fair price isn't for Kant considered a morally good act, right? Because the person isn't doing it uh, for duty's sake. They're doing it uh, for their own long-term personal gain. But the actions seem to have the same consequences as if they were to do it for duty's sake. A person that would do it for duty's sake wouldn't care about whether it produced um, good uh, out, a, a good outcome for them in particular or not. They would do it simply because it was the right thing to do. Um, again, if we take the example that Kant gives of a person asking to borrow money uh, because they're in financial difficulty, 
if we suppose, for example, the person decides to pay back the money, in the example Kant gives, the person decides not to pay back the money, but we'll, we'll sort of amend this example a bit and say, in this example, the person does decide to give back the money. There would be two reasons that they could at least. One would be because they might want to borrow money in the future, and they think, oh, if I repay, then I'll be able to borrow money in the future. Again, for Kant, this would be in accordance with duty, meaning it would align with the right action, um, but it would not be done for duty's sake. Again, it would be done uh, for the long-term personal gain the person would experience from paying the other person back that they borrowed the money from, and therefore in the future having the opportunity to borrow more money. If another person pays back because they say it's the right thing to do, I made a promise, I should keep the promise I made. What if everyone um, didn't keep the promises? Uh, and therefore, I know the right thing to do is to keep the promise and pay back the money, not because it's going to help me out particularly, but simply because it's the right thing to do. Then it would be in alignment with duty, but it would also be out of duty and it would be considered a morally good action. So um, the goodwill is the only unqualified good and the goodwill wills out of this out of duty. So what is it that the goodwill wills? So it wills out of duty. That's that's how it wills. But what is it that, that the goodwill wills? And the goodwill wills that every individual should be able to do this action. And we'll get to why that is in a second. But what this is saying, before you uh, do an action, before you ask yourself if an action is good or bad, you have to ask yourself, according to Kant, what would happen if everyone did this? So we'll go back to the um, example of borrowing money and, and not repaying. And so in this situation, Kant describes an individual who is um, financially not in a good place, is, is uh, needing to borrow money to pay bills, but also knows that they won't be able to repay the loan that they make. So they think to themselves, uh, I'll, I'll ask to borrow money, I'll promise to repay the money, but I know that I won't be able to repay the money, but it will sort of fix my short-term financial problems and it will be good for me. Now, in one sense, you might think the action is, is good for the individual particular person. They will be able to solve their financial problems and they will be able to borrow money, uh, but they'll have to lie. They'll have to tell the person they're borrowing the money from that they will be able to repay, but in reality, they know they won't. But if they told the person that they uh, um, wouldn't be able to repay the money, then the person wouldn't let them borrow it. So they think to themselves, the best thing for me to do in this situation is to lie to the person and say, yes, I will repay you, when in reality, they know they won't be able to. So Kant says, um, what, what, um, is the morally good thing to do. The person asked themselves, well, what if everyone did this? What if everyone, when they made a promise, broke the promise? What would happen? And ultimately, Kant argues that bad things would happen. Not only would uh, no one trust anyone, but the very notion of a promise would be meaningless. If um, when we would make a promise, we would break it. So Kant says you should never do this, right? You uh, should not ever make a false promise. And not because it wouldn't be beneficial to you in a particular situation, but because the goodwill asks, what if everyone were to do this? And if after asking that question, the outcome is negative for society, then one should refrain from doing it not because they wouldn't personally experience gain, but because duty would dictate that it would be a bad thing for society. And therefore, what you will um, when you perform an action is, can this action 
uh, be done universally? Can this action uh, be done by everyone without bringing harm to society? If it can, go ahead and do the action. If it can't, don't do the action, or depending on the context, do the opposite of the action. So then, um, so, so now let's, let's um, sort of summarize for a second. Uh, Kant says the only unqualified good is the goodwill. What does the goodwill will? Um, that, there, that the actions that they take can be done universally by everyone, and they will that their action can be done universally by everyone out of duty's sake, not for personal gain, but out of duty's sake. Now, why is this the goodwill? Why does the goodwill will that um, their actions could be repeated by everyone? Uh, why, why do they will that their actions are universal? And this is, um, Kant justifies this by pointing to what he calls the uh, subject, subjective principle of human action. And what he means by this is when we humans act, we act uh, with ourselves as an end in ourselves, as opposed to a means to an end. When we act in the world, whenever we um, will or do something, we see ourselves as the reason why we're doing it. So for example, suppose I um, purchase a cell phone. I purchase the cell phone for me. Uh, whereas the people who are selling me the cell phone, they might not be thinking of my best interest. They might be thinking of theirs. And you can do this with any product, suppose a car. When you're purchasing a vehicle, you're doing it for yourself as an end in, in yourself. You're doing it to help you. The person selling you the car uh, may not be doing it to help you. They may be doing it to help them. But each person, when they do the actions that they do, they see themselves, to use Kant's phrase, as an end in themselves. They don't see themselves as a means to an end. They may see you, the customer, as a means to an end, but they don't see themselves as a means to an end. And so Kant says, if we as individuals always see ourselves as an end in ourselves and not as a means to an end, this principle that each individual has is universalizable, which means each and every person sees themselves as an end in themselves, as opposed to a means to an end. And therefore, when we act, we have to ask ourselves, can everyone do this? And if the answer is yes, what that means is we haven't made any one individual a means to an end. But rather, if we can universalize our action, if we can see that if everyone did it, it'd be okay, we're not treating anyone as a means to an end. Rather, we're treating everyone as an end in themselves. And this is uh, basically respecting all people by, by not um, doing any action that could treat anyone as a means to an end. The resulting society for Kant um, from this, uh, what he calls the categorical imperative uh, that uh, is derived from, from this idea that everyone is an end in themselves and no one is a means to an end. This is called the kingdom of ends in which every member of society is, is treated as an end in themselves and not a means to an end. And this has important ethical applications that we'll get to in a second. But now we'll ask, well, is this possible? And in an earlier work called uh, The Critique of Pure Reason, uh, Kant has uh, a section called the antinomies, and there's four antinomies, uh, the last one uh, being freedom. And so what the antinomies will be, Kant will actually uh, draw a, uh, a vertical line down the center of a page and on one side argue for one possibility, and on another side argue uh, for the reverse possibility. And his point is that both arguments given pure reason or just logic are equally valid, which means you can't really use pure reason to figure out things like are we free or are we determined. On one side of the dividing line, Kant will argue that we are free, and it definitely seems as though we are free from our subjective perspective. When we act and do things, we act as though we are free. It seems like we're free 
to us. But then when we look at the actions of other persons, uh, we see them more as, as objects and we say, oh, we can see how external events determine them. And so we're not really uh, sure if we use pure reason or, or logic, whether we are free or determined. But given ethics, uh, ethics sort of, um, according to Kant, uh, presupposes a freedom, presupposes that we're able to uh, choose good and, and not evil. And so for Kant, we can never be sure if we're free in, in what he calls a noumenal or infinite reality, uh, free in ourselves. But for practical purposes, uh, we assume that we are free. And if we are uh, able to uh, act morally, meaning uh, to will something out of duty's sake, uh, then that provides a bit of evidence that we might be free. We might not be determined by any other cause um, in, in doing this action, which would, um, which would perhaps hinder the action being done simply for, for duty's sake. And so this is where he essentially leaves the argument. Um, so let's summarize really quickly. Uh, the only unqualified good is a good will. What is a good will? A good will is a will that wills something for duty's sake. Uh, what does it will? It wills that the action that it takes can be universalized. Why does it will it? It wills it out of the expansion of the subjective principle of human action, meaning that every individual sees themselves as an end in themselves and not a means to an end. And we want to respect every individual and never treat anyone as a means to an end. This becomes the categorical imperative. The societal result of the categorical imperative is called the kingdom of ends in which everyone in society lives as an end in themselves and all morally correct actions are actions in which no the result of which no individual is treated as a means to an end. How do we know we have freedom to do this? Given pure reason, we don't, but practical uh, reasoning allows for the possibility of this freedom through morally uh, correct actions. So what does this mean uh, for society and for morality? Well, it would mean two things. Uh, one is that the consequences of an individual action would not matter for morality, but rather the intent of the individual action would matter for morality. And, and so the, this contrasts with a lot of other ethical theories, particularly consequentialism and, and a certain genre of consequentialism, utilitarian ethics, which would argue that um, what is moral is the greatest good for the greatest number. And so in, in uh, distinction to uh, the Kantian ethics, one person could be sacrificed for say the greater good under a consequentialist or utilitarian paradigm, whereas Kant would argue that an individual uh, should never be treated as a, as a means to an end, as opposed to an end in themselves. And therefore an individual could not be sacrificed for the greater good because it would be morally wrong to ever treat an individual as a uh, means to an end, uh, as opposed to an end in themselves. Um, when we think of uh, smaller cases of, of, of the number of people, such as um, would you say sacrifice one to save five, the, uh, the famous uh, trolley car example, uh, when the numbers are small, it, it seems to, to some extent that the, uh, that the Kantian argument has stronger weight, even, even though uh, it's more of a rational principled argument. When the numbers are, are um, quite large, would you sacrifice one person to save a billion? Then the Kantian argument becomes uh, much more difficult uh, to, to uh, justify. And the utilitarian argument seems to, uh, to make more sense. 
I think I think both arguments really um, uh, focus in on aspects of of what could be considered um, the the morally correct action, but they do run into uh, contradictions or oppositions with each other rather quickly. So when thinking about uh, the implications for society, it, it does seem uh, rather nice that, that Kant has a rational argument um, for morality in which no one should ever be treated as a means to an end, but everyone should be treated as an end in themselves. But oftentimes in society, uh, complications um, will occur such that you have to um, make a decision that might end up leaving one person or or um, or a group of people as as um, as a, uh, a a negative action would happen to them for a greater good and this would be uh, seen as immoral uh, given the Kantian argument but would be seen as a uh, a morally correct action given certain forms of consequentialism such as uh, utilitarian ethics. So I hope this uh, helps in outlining um, the groundwork and also seeing some of the implications of the groundwork and also seeing one example of a uh, argument for an objective rational morality. Take care.